Um, very warm welcome from uh, the team at the Public and Patient Engagement Collaborative. Um, we're really excited to host this uh, third webinar in our spring webinar series. Um, welcome back to those of you who've attended our previous webinars and, and welcome if, if there are some of you who are attending for the very first time, we're, we're happy to have you. Based on um, the response to this particular topic, uh, clearly there's there's great interest, uh, which is terrific from across the McMaster community as well as uh, well beyond that, um, both across Ontario and, and Canada and even a few uh, international participants. So we're really excited to welcome you all. Um, I'm going to introduce our presenters in a couple of minutes, um, a couple of moments actually, uh, but wanted to acknowledge my uh, PPEC team members who uh, really have played an instrumental role in putting together this spring webinar series, and in particular, helping to conceptualize and, and uh, set up the structure for today's webinar. So that's Laura Tripp and Julia Rogers from, uh, from my team. So really wanted to uh, to thank you for your hard work on this. Um, if we can move to the next slide, I'd like to uh, just briefly acknowledge the uh, traditional territories that we're gathering on. In my case, I'm here in my office at McMaster University, which is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee people. Um, in the case of our uh, East Toronto Health Partners, um, they are lo located within Treaty 3 territory um, on the ter traditional territories of the Wendat, also Mississauga and Haudenosaunee people. Um, and, and both of our organizations are within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. And I just wanted to, uh, to really honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, um, their valuable past, and present contributions to this land and, and to acknowledge those who were here long before us and recognize our responsibility to respect and honor the intimate relationship um, that indigenous peoples have to their land. So maybe we just pause for a moment of reflection and then move on to the next slide. Thanks, Laura. So we have two key webinar objectives for today. The first is to share a newly released tool to support equity-centered engagement. And this is a, a tool um, and really a guide and some tailored resources that the collaborative and it, along with um, colleagues at the uh, Public Engagement and Health Policy Project McMaster have worked hard on over the last uh, almost year um, to, to develop and, and, and release. And so our first speaker is going to be presenting that work. And then we'll have some examples shared of how we put equity-centered engagement in practice. I think many of us think about the importance of this, recognize it, but also recognize the challenges in doing this work well um, and, and appropriately and sensitively. So we have really tried to combine the kind of high level principles of how do we think about these things? Uh, how do we approach this really important work? And then with our um, uh, East Toronto Health Partners uh, have some really good concrete examples of how to do this work in practice. So if we can just turn to our uh, presenters. So really, really excited to introduce our three presenters. Uh, Moise Luhak, who is a research assistant with our collaborative and also was a fellow with the Public Engagement and Health Policy Project at McMaster and is a recent grad of the Masters in Public Health program here at McMaster and also now works at the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions in Toronto. Uh, Razia Rashid is a patient, caregiver, and community partner with East Toronto Health Partners. And I think um, also just important to recognize East Toronto Health Partners is an Ontario health team. So one of over 50 uh, teams across the province that is um, supported by the Ministry of Health to work towards um, the uh, implementation of integrated delivery uh, health systems at a local level. Um, and, uh, and of course, that uh, have, a, have a particular focus on priority populations. So Razia Rashid Shed and Anina Pendevska will be um, our two co-presenters from um, the East Toronto Health Partners uh, OHT. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to, to Moisa, our first presenter, and then uh, we'll actually run Moisa's presentation right into Razia and Anina's presentations. I'll just do a little bit of a handover in between. Um, and then um, have our time after for, for Q&A. The chat is open, Q&A, um, but I think we'll hold off just to make sure we give them all their time to present and then hopefully have a robust uh, um, active um, discussion. So over to you, Moisa. 
Thank you so much, Julia. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really honored to present our team's work on the Supporting Equity-Centered Engagement Guide. The first bit of our presentation, I'll just give a bit of background information and share some of our processes for developing the guide. And then I'll actually take you through the guide itself. So you can kind of take a look at what it looks like, um, how you can use it, um, things like that. Alrighty. So um, obviously, we're all here on this very specific topic of a webinar, so I'm sure a lot of us are aware that more and more uh, groups doing research or doing work in healthcare organizations are really recognizing the importance of doing engagement work that really has an equity focus, and we're really understanding how important it is to meaningfully and respectfully engage with people from various backgrounds, identities, and experiences. So, of course, you know, when we're conducting engagement work, whether as individuals or as organizations, it's really important to carefully consider how we will be championing equity in our engagement work. And of course, this isn't an easy endeavor. It can definitely be challenging and time consuming work, but it's definitely nonetheless crucial to avoid perpetuating inequities and harms in the work that we do. So, you know, some people might think that, you know, thinking about equity begins and ends with recruitment. So when we're recruiting individuals, patient partners, or putting together our councils, advisory councils or committees, we just want to think about recruiting from wider backgrounds, things like that. But really, we should be thinking about equity beyond just recruitment and thinking about how we can aim to bring an equity lens throughout our entire engagement work. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. And so, of course, you know, many people and organizations that are conducting engagement work need to be well supported in this work of prioritizing equity and centering equity in all of our engagement work that we do. And of course, many of us are seeking out resources to support that uh, task. And luckily, there are a lot of resources that exist out there to support this kind of work. Um, but really, there's little guidance on, you know, which ones are the most relevant to the different contexts of our organizations and the work that we do. And there's also little guidance on how we use the resources and when we can use the resources. So there really was a need for a curated guide or a tool that could provide direction on how to bring that equity focus to our engagement work. And that also connects us to the existing resources out of what is already out there. And of course, importantly, the guide needed to be simple, clear, and easy to use for the people who uh, intend to use them. Next slide, please, Laura. And so that's kind of where our project began. And to achieve this, we started out by identifying public, patient, and community engagement resources and tools that really explicitly focused on that equity piece. Then these resources that we identified were then assessed across a number of categories. So thinking about comprehensiveness as it relates to that equity focus, ease of understanding, functionality, and engagement. And when we assessed the resources, we were just thinking not in terms of you know, providing any judgment or val numerical value on any of the resources, but thinking about what the resources that we identified could offer in relation to those four categories. We then uh, curated a set of resources based on those four criteria, and then we kind of presented them. So, you know, um, describing what they offered and their key elements and things like that. And then finally, we came up with a way to guide people through the resources. So thinking about, you know, identifying the steps that are involved in bringing an equity lens to our engagement work, and then linking to the most relevant resources uh, that support each of those steps involved. And next slide, please, Lauren. All right, and so this is what our final product looks like, uh, that image on the right, and it is available as a printable PDF version and an online interactive version, which can be found on the Public and Patient Engagement Collaborative website. And I will um, link, I will share the link in the chat and then move to share my screen so then I can walk you through, but the link is there in case anyone wants to follow along. Thanks, Laura. All righty, can everyone see my screen? Okay, perfect. So yeah, as I mentioned, this is on the PPEC website right here. Um, and I'll walk you through all the different elements of the guide so you can really get a sense of um, what it looks like and what it can be used for. So the guide is accompanied by a bit of background information um, and information on how this guide was developed, kind of similar to what I've just ran through with you uh, right now. So if, in, uh, if you're interested in that information, you can always look through that. And then this is the guide itself, the interactive version, as you saw in the slide. Um, and if you just scroll down, there's also a PDF version that that's, uh, you can link to and open that up as well. So really the guide consists of five key steps that are involved in bringing an equity lens to engagement work. And these are denoted in the uh, bubbles here. So we have, how can we prepare to engage in a way that centers equity? 
How do we plan for engagement that centers equity? How do we connect with our populations for engagement? What strategies can we use to foster equity? And then how will we continue to foster equity after engagement is complete? And then each, if you hover over each of the bubbles, they give you kind of a little bit of an explanation of each of those steps. Um, and each step is accompanied by about two to three sub steps. And these are really like key concepts uh, to consider when you're uh, thinking about each of those larger steps. So for instance, if we're thinking about how to how can we prepare to engage in a way that centers equity, that can involve understanding equity and related terms and concepts, recognizing why taking an equity-centered approach to engagement is needed, and then reflecting on our roles and positions. And so that is like similar sub-steps are incorporated throughout for each of those five main uh, steps. And so for each of those steps, we offer a few relevant resources that are tailored to and that support each step. So for instance, if we're thinking about reflecting on our roles and positions, if you click on that step there, it offers a couple of resources there to, that may help you with that uh, endeavor of reflecting on our roles and positions. And so a lot of our resources are more text-based, but we offer a couple of video-based resources as well um, to um, think about um, you know, different learning formats and different ways we can uh, uh, learn, whether it's text-based or video-based as well. Uh, and what's really uh, help you, helps even further is that not only do we link to the specific resources, but we link through to the specific section of the resources. So, you know, a lot of these resources can be really long. And so we wanted to link to the most specific and relevant section um, that helps with each of the steps to really help you parse through the resources and help you understand, you know, what part, what they can be used for and how they can be used. So, for instance, if we're thinking about um, how do we connect with our populations for engagement? And you know, we want, want to think about establishing trust and meaningful relationships. There's a couple of resources here. And so this Beyond Inclusion, Equity and Public Engagement resource, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's an 82 page resource. So that's a lot of information to parse through. And so here we share the specific section that relates to the establishing trust and meaningful relationships piece. So the principle of working in reciprocal relationships with communities. So if you were to click on that resource there, um, there we go. And it links you specifically to that specific section about working in reciprocal relationships with communities. So again, just really uh, with that specificity there. And that's throughout. So every time we share a resource, there's a specific section of the resource um, that um, we share uh, that is the most relevant and supports that step. And another thing that we kind of really wanted to emphasize is that, you know, a lot of our resources provide, you know, key information and, and, and conceptual information, but some also take a practical action-oriented approach to really help put the concepts into practice. So for instance, if we're thinking about how we might plan for engagement that centers equity, and we want to think about who we want to engage with and why, uh, we provide some resources that provide, can, you know, help us think through that information, but then some of our resources are worksheets, for instance, that really where we can go through and do the work ourselves and kind of think about uh, how we might do that part of thinking about who, who we want to engage with and why. And so that's something you can choose to, you know, go through on your own um, and really put those principles into practice. Uh, similarly, some resources offer examples or case studies, and of course, we're going to go through an example and case study similar later today about taking an equity-centered lens, um, but so some of our resources do that as well um, uh, when they talk about some of these concepts that we address here. So for instance, if we're thinking about addressing power imbalances, there's a couple of resources here. So this Let's Talk Community Engagement for Health Equity resource, if you open it up, it kind of gives a little bit of um, background information and strategies about that kind of addressing power imbalances and sharing power with communities. And then it also gives us an example of an organization and what they do in practice to address power imbalances and in their work. And similarly, in uh, another resource beyond inclusion, equity and public engagement, uh, if you open that up, they have a section on decentering engagement and really thinking about those power dynamics. And then they share a detailed case study about an example of community-led engagement. And so how those ideas of decentering engagement and addressing power imbalances were put into practice in this organization's work. So really we have a kind of good, a blend of you know, those more uh, nitty gritty conceptual resources as well as ones that really take us through uh, some of those action oriented and practical approaches um, as well. I'll also just want to briefly show you the PDF if that's something, you know, the interactive version is really cool, but sometimes, you know, for folks, a nice plain document is, is more helpful. And so we have that as well. Um, and it's the exact same content, the exact same text and information just in a PDF format. So we have those five steps there and each of the steps, you know, if you click on it, 
um, it has those sub steps, and then again, it links out to those um, specific sections of the resource. So very, very similar. And finally, I also just wanted to point out that we also do have a, a French version of the guide as well. So it's French language version. So all of kind of the text that we, we put out, it's in French. Um, the actual interactive version as well as the PDF is in French. And we, where we were able to identify French alternative to the resources, we were able to share those. So for instance, the Beyond Inclusion um, resource has a French alternative version. And so when we link out to that uh, resource, it links out to the uh, French version of the resource. And then where we weren't able to find the French version, we just made a note that it is available in English. So just, we really wanted to have that option of you know, having the French alternatives um, and then just making a note where they weren't um, available or they weren't um, accessible. So those are the main things that I wanted to share. So I really encourage you, um, if you have, you, have, you have the link and you're able to access this, that, that's great. You can go through um, and you know play with it on your own. Um, and if you do you know, end up using the guide, you know really the resources, we, re we really enjoyed going through them. And we hope that when you do, you, if you do end up using it as a tool to support your equity center and engagement work, really encouraging you to think about and reflecting on your own context and the context of your organization, the engagement work that you do, and the populations you seek to engage. Um, so I, that is the end of my bit of the presentation. So I will pass it on to uh, Julia and then uh, Razia and Nina. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks very much, Moisa. So uh, really excellent overview of this. As, as you can see, there's a lot to this, but we tried to find this uh, nice balance between kind of high level principles and, and this guided tour um, that that Moise is showing you and uh, down kind of into the nitty gritty details. Um, but in particular, I think highlighting the excellent resources that are out there. I think that was really just um, quite a um, a gift of this work is that there already are many, many excellent resources. I think it's just a matter of maybe pulling them together and helping people um, navigate what uh, is already there. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn things over to our uh, East Toronto Health Partner presenters. So um, that is Razia and uh, Nina, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks for the introductions and the invitations uh, to present the work of East Toronto Health Partners and the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Council. Um, again, congratulations to your team for that wonderful guide that you just uh, shared with us um, that supports equity-centered engagement. Uh, Laura, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so Razia and I prepared a few slides that will provide you with a bit of an overview uh, of the East Toronto Ontario Health Team, or ETHP, uh, our approach to engagement and the work of one of our councils, the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Council. Next slide, please. Um, so for context, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes introducing you to the work of East Toronto Ontario Health Team. I understand that we may have some participants outside of Ontario who may not be familiar with the Ontario Health Teams. Um, the Ontario Health Teams were established about three to four years ago as a new way of organizing and delivering care that it's more connected to patients in their local communities. Uh, I don't know the, the latest number, but I think there are currently between 50 and 60 Ontario health teams across the province uh, that have been approved. So the idea with the OHTs is that uh, to support provider partnerships and under Ontario health teams, healthcare providers like hospitals, long-term care homes, uh, family doctors, uh, home and community care providers, they, they work as a one coordinated team. So next slide, please. So we work in East Toronto and uh, we serve approximately 350,000 people from 21 diverse neighborhoods. Uh, many immigrants uh, call East Toronto home. Uh, you can see that we have some 50 different languages spoken locally. Uh, five of Toronto's priority neighborhoods are located in Toronto. So uh, these are Torncliffe Park, Taylor Massey, Oak Ridge, Victoria uh, Village, and Flemington Park. Uh, a lot of our work is focused on improving access to programs and services in these neighborhoods, and I'll speak more about the city's priority neighborhoods later on. Next slide, please. 
So Istirana is a partnership of um, over 100 uh, engaged partner organizations. Uh, on this slide, you can see our anchor partners. Um, those are eight different organizations uh, that represent different sectors. So we really function as a network of networks. Uh, we were, I think, the, the first OHT to have an organized network of primary care providers. And this has been really important uh, in an area of the city that really struggles with access to primary care. Um, and we also have patient and caregiver advisors uh, who sit at the leadership table. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide, you can see our engagement structures that we currently have in place. Uh, we have both priority population focus uh, on engagement as well as priority neighborhoods engagement focus. Uh, the community advisory council that you see at top is comprised of East Toronto residents uh, from various neighborhoods in East Toronto and provides an oversight of uh, our engagement efforts. Uh, in addition, we have a very active caregiver advisory group and two youth advisory councils. Uh, to support our work in the priority neighborhoods, we've created Taylor Massey and Torncliffe Park resident and wellness councils. Uh, all of the patients, caregivers, and community advisors together create a broader advisory network we currently have about 60 engaged advisors in this network, um, and we also have approximately 60 health community ambassadors. The ambassadors are recruited from priority neighborhoods, and they help us with health promotion activities and outreach in the priority neighborhoods, and they were really instrumental to our success, the, the success of our vaccination strategy during the pandemic. The step-by-step -step guide that was introduced earlier also speaks about what organizations can do to prepare to engage in a way that focuses on equity, um, the importance of understanding equity and the need for equity-centered approach to engagement. We often see public engagement initiatives that struggle to draw participants who truly represent the uh, communities that they are impacted by a, a decision. Uh, at ETHB, we have learned that engagement has to be intentional, planned, uh, not an afterthought. Uh, that's why the role of our community advisory council, for example, is so critical because they hold ETHB accountable for all of the engagement work. Um, the principles of equity uh, focused engagement are part of the orientation for all of our advisors. Uh, next slide, please. The step-by-step -step guide also uh, speaks about what engagement strategies foster equity and the importance of ensuring participants feel respected and valued, as well as the importance of uh, addressing um, power imbalances. So I just wanted to show you our engagement approach. Uh, you can see the engagement spectrum and the different levels of engagement. We try to work across the engagement spectrum. However, we see the most value in working at the far end of of the spectrum. So by including advisors in the work of different ETHP committees and working group, but especially by creating dedicated advisory councils, which are groups of advisors that are supported by his staff. This approach of creating separate councils where the community members are in the majority is one of those examples of strategies that foster equity and address the power imbalances. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and that is why we measure our success in community engagement through the number of community-led initiatives and why community-led initiatives is a measure of success. Because for us, that means that our advisors feel empowered and supported to bring forward their ideas of what needs to be done. Uh, we work together on ETHP initiatives, but we also leave space for our advisors to work on initiatives that are important to them. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to focus more on the work of the Tila Massey Resident Wellness Council. Um, next slide, please, I think, yeah. 
Uh, in the context of equity approach to engagement and our work in the Taylor Massey neighborhood, I wanted to briefly speak about Toronto's strong neighborhood strategy from 2020. It identified 31 neighborhoods across Toronto that fall below the recommended neighborhood equity benchmark. Uh, and this benchmark is determined by a number of factors, which also includes health factors. Uh, and those health factors uh, include things like the diabetes rates, mental health, uh, ear visits, uh, preventable hospitalization, and so on. As mentioned previously, five of these priority neighborhoods are located in East Toronto, and this includes the Taylor Massey neighborhood. So the step-by-step -step guide, uh, actually, if we can go back to the previous slide, the step-by-step -step guide speaks about how do we plan for engagement that focuses on equity and the importance of thinking who we need to engage and why and understanding the need, uh, the needs of the population we want to engage. So over the next few slides, I will touch upon these topics and how we approach them in practice. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just one example of the type of data that we looked at. Uh, this specifically is from the Ontario uh, Community Health Profile Partnership and shows the emergency department visits. Um, so you can see the Taylor Massey neighborhood having the second highest rate of high urgency visits after Moss Park neighborhood. And looking at data really helps us understand the population we want to engage with. And uh, But this is only the first step of, of the process. Next slide, please. Uh, before we embarked in, uh, in engagement, we looked at different sources of data and we conducted focus groups with residents from Taylor Massey and uh, Razia uh, too was involved in the outreach and conducting the focus groups. Uh, the slide really shows the summary of our findings uh, that informed our approach to working in the Taylor Massey neighborhood. As you can see through this process, we identified challenges uh, related to accessing services such as, you know, um, community mental health supports and so on, um, high ED visits, including for mental health related issues, and a significant number of ALC uh, uh, impact on ALC rates uh, due to people uh, staying in hospital with chronic illness that would be better taken care of in the community. Uh, we also identified many access challenges. I mentioned community based mental health supports. Also, uh, a huge thing for us is access to primary care. There's need for more home care services services for seniors, as well as culturally appropriate services. And much of this is a result of the social determinants of health. Uh, people in the Taylor Massey neighborhood, um, they face systemic racism, food insecurity, issues with housing. Uh, you're all aware of the cost of living in Toronto and in general and the lack of affordable housing options. Um, and since many of the residents are recent immigrants, uh, they also report issues with settlement, low income and limited access to, to good and stable jobs. Uh, next slide, please. So, and the partner organizations came together and adopted the collective impact model. They agreed on a vision for ETHP's work in Taylor Massey, uh, and that is to improve health outcomes by addressing these health inequities. And the step-by-step -step guide also stresses the importance of setting goals for community engagement and working collaboratively. Our partner organizations identified a number of outcomes, such as increased community engagement, coordinated supports, shared accountability, and improved uh, patient and provider experience, and their collective uh, impact approach is focused on collaborative leadership, sharing of data, quality improvement, and evaluation. So acting on residents' input, uh, one of the first goals for us was to create Health Access Taylor Massey to address the primary care access. So Hadam, Health Access Taylor Massey is a healthcare, community, and social service center uh, with a goal to improve the health of local residents by making it easier for people to access care uh, where in one place that is close to home. And our Hadam team uh, speaks many different languages that are spoken in the neighborhood, such as Arabic, Farsi, Hindi, Tagalog, and Urdu. Uh, next slide, please. 
So following the foundation setting work of learning about the TLMS and neighborhood and agreeing on a, collect, a collaborative approach, uh, ETHP created a steering committee uh, to lead the work. And Razia has been a member of the steering committee from uh, the very beginning. Uh, we then created the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Council, and they have been instrumental in informing the work of Health Access Taylor Massey. Uh, members of the council also sit on the operations committee, uh, which looks at more practical details of the work of the partners, such as developing a common referral process and so on. So the step-by-step -step guide uh, speaks about how do we engage, the importance of establishing trust, reaching diverse voices, and reducing barriers to engagement. And with that said, I am now going to hand it over to Razia to speak about the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Council and our recruitment approaches. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's my honor to be part of this meaningful uh, webinar um, that my um, heart and mind uh, always reach out to the community members and speak about the need of the community. And uh, truly, it's an honor to be part of uh, this webinar. So uh, as Nina mentioned about my involvement at the steering committee, and in December 2020, uh, East Toronto Health Partner initiated a study um, of the Taylor Massey neighborhood. And Nina covered uh, pretty much about the purpose of the study was to develop a framework to strengthen engagement and collaboration, support building a healthier community in Taylor Massey, and identifying steps that she referred to to improve the way people get healthcare and social supports. One of the recommendation of the resulting report was the creation of the Taylor Massey Residence Wellness Council. And therefore the recruitment, uh, <clears throat> the process and strategy uh, was developed. And then um, see so if I could please uh, have the next slide, please. Uh, the previous one, please. Thank you. So with uh, with these um, strategies in, in place, um, what we have done, we reached out to the local residents from the diverse neighborhood of Taylor Massey um, to reach out to promote and to talk about uh, who the council members be and what we're going to do. The purpose of the council is to support the work of improving health and social outcomes, right? So therefore, um, how are we gonna um, find the right people um, to be part of the council. So we thought we would probably be better to start with 10 to 12 residence members. And uh, some of the mandates that's laid out here would be supporting the planning, co-designing, implement implementation of projects. And one of the projects that Nina mentioned about HETM, um, that was uh, our true success and, and involvement. And other than that, we participate in a lot of other um, projects as well, uh, sometimes in a uh, consultation role, sometimes just uh, to review the work, sometimes as a community member, what's our input. So we provide, um, support at the steering committee uh, and operations level. And then also we um, ensure that residents are at the center in the planning for delivering of integrated healthcare and social services. And through this involvement, um, we are further establishing trust and meaningful relationships uh, with the community members uh, and engage them appropriately. Next slide, please. And as uh, we talked about, Nina talked about data. So this is uh, data that we looked at uh, when we um, talked about uh, where and how we could um, outreach. So these are the uh, large building data that we looked at uh, reviewing the emergency visits. The ED visits been high and um, discussed among ourselves and then bringing back to the steering committee that uh, how, how do we approach those uh, neighborhoods or those uh, large buildings links to see uh, what are the gaps are and how could we have them engage. So um, is that the resource is not available or there are gaps that we are not able to minimize if we cannot uh, completely eliminate, uh, how can we minimize it? Uh, are they aware of the existing resources? So we actually dive deep into um, th those strategies and to see where do we outreach. And um, so we outreach towards uh, school council level, to the tenant union level, to uh, get the words out. So come on, get involved. This is a great way. Uh, 
to give back to the community. We want to hear from you. And again, uh, our lenses were always open to reach out to the diverse voices, uh, focus on equity um, and deserving groups. Um, and as you know, um, that the community is such that uh, we have a lot of marginalized uh, individuals or family who are also underrepresented. So we wanted to ensure that we reach out to uh, the folks with the equal lenses as well. Next slide, please. Okay, the council member, we, we meet once, um, every two weeks. Um, however, given the summer, we are taking a break um, uh, unless there are specific projects that's happening and there's a subcommittee that's working in another projects. Um, and then through our involvement, there are a lot of um, various ETHPs activities that we participate on that you um, can see here. Uh, health access Taylor Messi, ETHP planning session that we participate, home care modernization project, um, youth Mental Health Portfolio, ETHP Advisor Network, Michael Garren Hospital to Home, um, CCUP, it's, it's a quality uh, improvement, um, community ambassadors so that we tie up with presentations and research that we also participate in. Next slide, please. Sorry, looks like for the internet, there is a slight delay from my end. Um, and uh, with our involvement, um, we we thought we would partner um, to apply for a research fund grant, and we experienced some barriers um, as uh, community uh, members, as a patient co-applicants. Uh, we thought we should pen an article to uh, showcase uh, that those barriers and and um, and also how it can make things smoother for a patient um, or advisor to get involved with such uh, um, collaborations uh, or, or partner. So we thought of writing an article as it states here. Um, so we wrote an article and it was published. So the article further explains the barriers to include patients uh, as partners in research when applying for grants from funding agencies. And, and uh, so please, I encourage you to take a look at that article um, to uh, get uh, some of the ideas that we proposed as well. It was myself and my other co-chair of Residence Wellness Council um, who buddied up with the research uh, scientist uh, at, at the hospitals uh, and, and the coordinator as well. So it was a great journey, uh, but we didn't want it to give up right there. Uh, we wanted to continue to learn and educate and move on. So uh, to bounce back. Next slide, please. Some of our other um, initiative that we led on, uh, led on to the communities, our friendly visiting program, accessibility initiative in the community. Um, uh, recent one was youth gaming and gambling uh, workshop partner with other agencies. Uh, we have arranged free tax clinics at Health Access Taylor Messi. Um, and our recent success is Taylor Messi Wellness Day that we have arranged at uh, Dentonia Park, which is the center of the neighborhood. And um, we were able to um, get a survey done by the community member again to get the ideas, get their voice heard, um, to learn more from them. What are the gaps if they're if they're waiting for service and how long are, uh, that waiting may look like, um, and what else we can do uh, moving forward. So we thought that would be an excellent opportunity to get to hear from them. So we didn't want to miss out on that. So we do have the survey um, results coming up soon to uh, review and to plan for further uh, networks, uh, networking day or events. So, um, and also to share with our health and social care partners in, um, in the community. And we also share information on programs and services um, on that day. So we invited um, the service par um, agencies in the community, um, identifying the needs who provides um, on hand uh, direct services. And um, so that could be seniors, youth, general, adults, children. And we had activities throughout the day. Uh, we reached out to um, 
Costco for some uh, sponsorship. Uh, it was actually a city funded uh, event and Costco was able to provide some uh, snacks for the day. And then um, a few other service agencies was able to provide lunches and there was a gift card, there were a lot of giveaway items. So there was a lot of engagement and Turnopolis services was there um, as well. So uh, I, I could show you some of those photos in the next slide, please. Um, so that's uh, the photo at the, right in front of Costco and it was a beautiful day out there. And, and then uh, there is a pictures on the bottom right hand uh, corner with the Teller Messi Residence Wellness Council and our support buddies, uh, Nina, Karma, Mary, um, and the council members. And it could, it, I'm not sure if the picture is clear enough to show the diversity here. We have different age groups, different cultural background. Um, two of us um, are people with uh, accessible need um, and, uh, and some of them are newcomers where others are established. And uh, so we have diverse uh, group of people here and we're looking for more opportunities to learn from each other. So this, these are some other photos where we had Hina done face painting um, and all that. So people are asking for more of these events and we were really, really th thrilled uh, to be able to have this event with 600 plus people joined from all different age groups and all different pockets of the neighborhood. Um, so we also partner with the um, agencies and um, so that they were able to provide the outreach strategy done by community ambassador that Nina was talking about. So they know exactly where to go, who, who to outreach for. And through the collaborations, uh, we were able to have a very successful event. Um, I think my turn is done here. Thank you once again for allowing me to be part of this vital conversation together. Let us embark on this journey towards a more equitable and just future. Thanks, Razia. Thanks. That was a, a wonderful overview of the work of the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Council. I just wanted to add that the the step-by-step -step guide also speaks about what we can do to continue to foster equity and the importance of acting on participant input and follow-up. And that's why the community-led initiatives that Razia mentioned um, uh, are really important to us. Uh, however, there's still work to be done across ETHP. We can definitely improve in this area of follow-up on uh, participant input. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I sneaked in one more slide. Um, Razia and Mohammed, who are both uh, council co-chairs are too modest to toot their own horns. I'm going to do it. Uh, last year, Razi and Mohammed were recognized for their work uh, in the community and were recipients of the Kaye Fuchs Award by the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Uh, this award is given to, to individuals for their contribution to improving health uh, care and demonstrated leadership. And we are really very proud of both Raz and Mohammed, and so glad that they were recognized as community leaders advocating for improved access to health and community services in Taylor Massey. Uh, and on that note, I think next slide, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank you for allowing us to share our work with you. Uh, we shared our contact information in case you want to reach out to us. And I believe uh, we now have time so for some questions from the audience. We do. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the excellent and very, very comprehensive um, presentations. Um, there's so much in there and I'm 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 going to go to the q and A. I know there's a question waiting. I saw it uh, pop up a little while ago and it's it's a it's a good one. it's a it's a bit of a uh, a hard hitting one and I think you covered it a little bit, but I'm gonna just turn to you. Um, it's it's the question is aside from communications and conversations, how has the work changed or improved the actual delivery of services and care or changed the system structurally? Razi, I'll give a stab at this and maybe you can jump in afterwards. Uh, I think we spoke about the the primary uh, reason why the, the council was created was to support the work of the Health Access Taylor Massey. And this was something that did not exist before that. So 
following the focus groups that we did with the with the residents and uh, all of the research we did looking at different data and getting to know the neighborhood led to that understanding that we need to improve access to primary care and that's what we've done so moving beyond the conversations we've we've actually supported the work of creating a, a hub in the heart of Taylor Massey that uh, where the service providers come together and try to provide services for for the residents um, we have now more primary uh, care like family physicians who have signed up to work out of that hub uh, we have service navigation services out of there, community mental health services and so on so and this is an ongoing work that has directly contributed to improving access to 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 health services in the neighborhood Razi, was there anything else you wanted to add so we cover pretty much all, and if there is um, the services that's not available, then the referral pathways that that establish so that it can be referred uh, outside the hub. Yeah, between the partner organizations and the the council members were involved in that work of looking at the referral process and provided suggestions of how that should work seamlessly for community members. And I just wanted to say we we are still involved, so we meet regularly with the uh, Health Access Taylor Massey operations team, um, and we bring back feedback as we gather from the community. Um, and if there is anything that uh, needs our, our consultation, we're always open to provide that feedback as well. Great, thanks. Thanks for that answer. And so just a couple of things. So um, Razi has let me know that uh, her co-chair Mohammed Shabani is here as well. So that's great. Welcome, Mohammed. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to move to the next question, which is one that I have in my mind um, as well always, and I might add to it a little bit. What The question is, what methods did you use to recruit members to the council to get diverse groups represented in the council? So this is, you know, Moise spoke to this a little bit too, right? This is often the very practical question that people have. And I mean, I think you spoke to it a little bit, and I, I guess I would expand it to not just the wellness uh, council, but uh, to, to your community advisory council, because you actually presented in your remarks, Anita, quite an elaborate, you know, very thoughtful um, kind of layering of, of councils, uh, committees, et cetera, which is a lot of people. And so I don't know if, if Razia or Anita wanted to mention one or two methods that you found particularly, you know, um, worked well, very successful. And then I would add to that too, if you're willing to think about this issue of retention, because we hear about this a lot in our work with, with uh, OHTs and other organizations, they're starting to have some concerns about retention. Um, so if you're, if you're, if you want to add to that as well, so I'll let either of you or both of you comment on this one. Lena, do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm also a community ambassador. So my involvement in the community over the pandemic uh, also played a role in terms of this uh, recruitment. And uh, the connection was such that we reached out to building superintendent, building managers, school principals, school uh, council, as I mentioned, um, and different uh, networks, different groups, because there's WhatsApp groups throughout the community. So it also depends on who you know and how you know and how do you propose uh, uh, certain things. And the tenant union was another way to get into, uh, get our outreach uh, uh, promotional materials out, out to them and have a conversation going even through WhatsApp messages uh, that this is who we are, this is what we're trying to do. And we also learn, I, I have learned from them as well that why they want to get involved or why they don't want to get involved and what are the barriers. And, and also uh, uh, you, you asked about the diverse range uh, and again, going into the cultural groups as well that through our connections. So uh, the community uh, ambassadors and those relationships uh, also helped. So we had um, uh, outreach uh, happen through the websites from ETHPs. Uh, so they, they have promoted all the service uh, provided, the partner agencies promoted uh, these materials. We had it posted all around the bus stops. The, like we really, targeted at the very hyper local level grocery store so uh, the high traffic areas uh, at the end of the school day when parents are coming together to pick up their kids we had conversation going out there so we really dedicated time 
uh, an effort. Um, my co-chair happened to also be a volleyball coach at a local community center. So he was another one and he has other connections in the community. So that that's how we were able to reach out to uh, that uh, generations as well. And then the seniors as well through our connections. So um, and the settlement workers reach out to the other folks who are new immigrant um, as well. Great, thanks. Do you, Nina, did you want to comment at, uh, at all on this one? Or? I think Razia covered the, you know, the recruitment approach can be very broad or can be very targeted, depend, like, what are the voices that are missing that we wanted to, to get involved? That's why we showed that slide with looking at the Michael Guerin Hospital data for emergency room visits to give us really detailed report on where those pockets of highest need are in the neighborhood, so by address, and we, we really target those uh, buildings. So they're in Crescent Town from where Razia is, but also on Doe's Road. Um, so those are some of the, the, the recruitment approaches we use. Um, I, I wanted to speak maybe briefly about the, the retention, because I understand that this is a, an issue. I think for us, retention was an issue at the beginning when we were starting, because when a recruitment first happened, there was no clear understanding of the role of the advisory councils and the bodies, because Typically, historically, PFACs, uh, you know, they existed within one organization and OHTs are partnerships of organizations. So you don't often see a tangible result of the work, right? Because it's at a system level. So there was a lot of frustration and, and so on until we, we had to evolve. We had to grow through that phase and kind of constantly remind people of what their mandate is, what the role of the advisor uh, is, and so on. And what really helps is to have engagement opportunities. So we have a really supportive leadership at uh, East Toronto Health Partners, and they're equally responsible to identify these engagement opportunities. Um, and then again, moving and defining uh, success through community-led initiatives really opened up those opportunities to keep people engaged because they suggest what they want to work on and then we support them like the Taylor Massey was really keen to have the Taylor Massey Resident Wellness Day and then we applied for a grant to the city um, to get funding for to organize the event so you really have to be kind of creative and thinking outside of the box like how do you keep uh, people engaged because they joined for a purpose right they want to see improvement and they they want to volunteer and want to give back to the community so you just have to create those opportunities for them to do that and fortunately we've been with a very stable membership of course people patients caregivers they go through you know things in their life that sometimes prevent them from uh, participating fully, but we leave the door open and many of them have uh, come back to us. So, yeah. And I would just like to add one more thing to it. Even during recruitment, we have noticed and one particular area would have a lot of people suddenly very excited and uh, would like to be engaged where we didn't have representation from another neighborhood. So instead of just filling up the position, we actually kept one or two spots for a long time open until we found uh, the right individual from the right. It's not the others were not eligible, they were, but again, we wanted to have voices heard from the diverse neighborhoods as well. So that was another angle we looked at. Fantastic. These are incredibly, um, you know, complete answers and really thoughtful and thorough and shows just how much work and thinking, you know, uh, an intention, right? To use your word, I think at the beginning, Nina, the intentionality of this, right? Being clear, about your goals, um, you're using data to help you identify the communities, um, populations you're you're looking to uh, to bring into your work. This combination of reaching out in you know the the ambassador role being so important, and clearly, um, uh, Razia, you are a community connector beyond <laughs> words. I can tell, um, and uh, and then having that community led piece, right? That's so it seems so important to retention, right? Because they're you know instigating, initiating, you know, leading some things. There's buy in, right? And and uh, an enjoyment and seeing you know some uh, 
some things happening. So really, really interesting, um, you know, thoughtful response. So a couple of other things along the lines of um, maybe reducing obstacles or barriers. Um, so what are the main obstacles to people participating or, you know, flipping it the other way, what are the supports that you found have been useful to reducing or minimizing barriers? And then maybe connected to that a little bit, these, this is from Emily Newberry, um, this idea of provision for, for virtual attendance at meetings. So that's a very specific question around, you know, do you do that? How does it work? And may, maybe you could comment on that. Uh, we usually meet virtually. And whenever we met in person, um, we asked if there is any um, um, anything that would th they need to support for them to arrange, and also the timing, that uh, because uh, some people work at certain certain times, others do not. So we need to be mind we needed to be mindful of what time would work for most of the people uh, as well. And yeah, there are times we hear noises of the children and we welcome them um, because that's the part of life. And despite of uh, being busy mother or father, they're still able to contribute this way. We need to appreciate uh, that, that effort as well. So we are all uh, aware of, of uh, those struggles that individual may have, but still it, it, they don't want to stop right there. They want to contribute. So we appreciate. Thanks, Razia. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> when we were developing our engagement strategy, we did think about what are some of the enablers of engagement? What are the, some of the things we need to consider? I mentioned, you know, supportive leadership being one, but also having dedicated staff to support engagement is really important because you can only ask so much out of volunteers, uh, right? So th there are things that you know they need to get the support from from staff uh, in order to move these community-led initiatives forward so that's my role um, we also have a recognition framework uh, where we try to um, and this is no compensation in any way for for the for the time the the advisors uh, spend uh, working in the different councils or working groups or committees, but to recognize that we really appreciate the involvement that you know we cover costs for transportation or childcare respite care and things like that. This is I think pretty standard across the OHDs to have something similar. Um, yeah, making accommodations for for participation. Uh, we we tried after. After the pandemic to start meeting in person and then we heard back from from people that said that really it, it works better for them it's more convenient to meet online so they prefer to meet online but we recognize that that in-person connection is really important so every once in a while we have in-person meetings where we do meet uh, together and more often now we have uh, ETHP events that are you know in person and we all meet there so that's it Great, thank you. So if I can sneak another one in, um, this is about um, engaging with physicians to, to lend support to the hub and, and whether they're compensated for their time and involvement, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly. Does that, that question make sense or do you need a little bit more? So we do have the East FPN, which is the Family Practice Network. And I mentioned, I think, in the beginning of my presentation that East Toronto Health Partners was really lucky that we have an organized network of family physicians. Uh, and that work has been led by Dr. Catherine Yu. Mm -hmm. I believe that she's now involved in trying to replicate and grow that kind of approach in the other OHDs. Um, so we've been really grateful for, for that connection. Uh, Dr. Yu is uh, regularly invited to CAC meetings, the, the Community Advisory Council meetings, because primary care access is so critical for, for us. We kept hearing repeatedly from advisors that had either issue with their doctor retiring and not being able to find a new one, um, you know, doctors that, you know, spoke their language, not having access to that kind of uh, service anymore, um, and just in general, just lack of access to, to primary care. So uh, we do try to work together with East FPN. As I said, we're trying to develop that relationship and through Dr. Catherine Yu. Um, and I think she was also involved in establishing the Health Access Daily Massey, and we're now thinking broader about different strategies at ETHP 
that can help us increase the number of doctors that open practices in uh, in East Toronto. But this is like very, you know, complex work that takes a lot of time. And I, I don't think East Toronto is any different from many of the other uh, parts of Toronto where access to primary care is, uh, it's a huge issue. I mean, uh, just across the board. Great. Thanks so much again um, for, for really thoughtful answers. And so with that, our, our time is up, unfortunately. It, it flew uh, by, but we, we wanted to, to bring a lot in in terms of content from our, our presenters and then have a chance to, to, to uh, have some, some questions and answers and some discussion. I think we did you know, a, a, a little bit of everything. Uh, and so I think you know where to uh, follow up with people. Uh, we have our own uh, email address, ppbc at mcmaster.ca, our website, we've show, shared that. Um, East Toronto Health Partners, uh, easy to find, even just Googling. Um, really, really thank you very much to our presenters. Fantastic work. And uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to reconnecting again, um, hopefully with a new um, fall sub, uh, webinar series, but we are gonna be spending some summer time planning that. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.